Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this webinar on demonstrating compliance with DORA. Before I go on, just to apologize on behalf of GoToWebinar yesterday, who had a, an outage which uh, they were unable to sort out quickly enough for us to have proceeded yesterday. Um, I'm sorry, the inconvenience that's caused for uh, many of you, many of you have been able to still make it on to uh, this webinar. Some couldn't, uh, and as I said, oh, sorry about that. So uh, I'm Alan Calder. I'm your host for today. I'm the founder of IT Governance. I've been in this business of cybersecurity and compliance for some 20 odd years, written a bunch of books on uh, ISO 27001, cybersecurity, GDPR, uh, and other topics uh, and uh, set up IT governance about 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, since then, uh, we have some 200 employees. We specialize in IT governance, risk and compliance solutions uh, operating uh, from uh, businesses in the UK, the EU and the US. We have some 12,000 clients uh, across all five continents and a comprehensive ISO 27001 products and service offering and ISO 27001 really supports uh, pretty well every other compliance uh, project that there is in the whole world. So uh, DORA is a clearly, and when you read DORA, it's clearly an application of ISO 27001 uh, to uh, to the law. We've helped more than 1,300 organizations with ISO 27001, delivered 1,600 cybersecurity projects, issued over 7,000 cyber essentials certificates, and helped uh, have more than 1,100 organizations using uh, some part of our governance risk and compliance software. So a lot of what we say on this and other webinars is informed by uh, large uh, volumes of experience with clients and across multiple sectors and industries. And we try and put that together in a way that helps our clients really get to grips with uh, the specific topic that it is that we're addressing. And today we're addressing uh, DORA, the Digital Operational Resilience Act. Uh, we'll be uh, running, I'm just running through the agenda, which is how to tackle the project, uh, why it's a positive step, uh, DORA compliance, why it can be uh, seen as a better benefit rather than a curse, uh, looking at how DORA aligns with ISO 27001, um, how organizations can prepare to navigate the regulatory shifts and emerging threats that are coming and how you can leverage automation to cost effectively manage and demonstrate compliance to what is a very comprehensive and complex uh, set of requirements. Webinar will take about uh, 40 minutes or so, 35 or 40 minutes of me talking. You've noticed that you're all on mute. That kind of helps deal with the background noise. Uh, and uh, when we come to the end of my presentation, uh, we'll have a time for questions. But if during the presentation you find there are things you want to ask about, please do go to the, um, uh, the question uh, box in the go to webinar panel which you should have on your screen in front of you uh, you can type any questions that you may have into uh, that panel and when we come to the end of the presentation i'll pick up the questions i'll share the question with the audience and then i will uh, answer the question assuming of course that i can so that's the plan um, and yes uh, to that first question which somebody will ask in a minute uh, the slides and recording will be available to everybody within a day or so of the webinar being completed. So how to tackle your compliance project. But before we do that, I just want to run a couple of polls, three or four polls, and those are really designed just to help us understand better um, the makeup of the audience so that we can better uh, focus uh, how we help organizations deal with that. So uh, poll one, uh, which we're launching now, please just answer, are you a key decision maker? Or are you somebody who influences uh, decisions, but not the final decision maker, or are you simply gathering information uh, for your team? Just quickly, I'll give you about 30 seconds just to pick one of those. Um, it's uh, There's no right or wrong, uh, just uh, uh, where you are. We're at 56% of people voted. Uh, another couple of seconds. Do We're not going to sell this information. This just helps us uh, better present uh, and organize our products and services for our clients. So. Okay, let's treat that as uh, closed. The uh, second poll that I want to run is what type of 
support does your organization need most for software for DORA compliance? Are you looking for a software compliance solution? Are you looking for uh, consultation and advisory services? Or are you looking for training and educational uh, resources? What is your, what's your current thinking about what you need in order to tackle uh, DORA compliance? Again, uh, we'll just run that for 30 seconds. 56%, um, 60% of people voted. Just another four or five seconds. Uh, which of these do you think is relevant to you? Thank you. And uh, we're currently in the kind of mood for polls. Your planned timeline for implementing DORA compliance next three months, four to six months, or beyond six months, or with no timeline set. Uh, which one do you fall into? And uh, bearing in mind, of course, that uh, the DORA compliance deadline is the 17th of January 2025. Uh, another 10 seconds or so. Uh, what's your timeline for implementing however you're going to go about getting yourself DORA compliant? It's interesting. Most people think beyond six months away. Thank you for that. Um, and then this could be pretty well uh, the final budget. Do you have a dedicated budget? Sorry, final poll. Do you have a dedicated budget? Are you thinking about one? I guess this might be helpful in terms of thinking about what you need or you don't have a budget allocated yet. So in terms of how you're going to go about tackling Dora, uh, just 15, 14 seconds left to vote. Interestingly, uh, the majority so far do not have a budget allocated to DORA compliance. That looks as though that's the way um, it already sits. So thank you very much. That's, uh, sorry, one more. Does your organization view integration of 27,001 solutions in support of DORA compliance? Are you looking at how you use ISO 27001 critically and immediately or important but not urgent or maybe something to consider in the future? Um, are you, how are you looking at implementing or integrating ISO 27001 into what you're doing in terms of DORA compliance? Just seven or eight seconds left to vote on that. And interestingly, about a third of you think that it's a critical immediate requirement uh, and then uh, um, uh, about 40% something to look at in the future. That's a kind of interesting spread. So thank you all very much. That's helpful information. It will help us think about how we develop and position and offer um, the range of information and other services that we do. So how to tackle your DORA compliance project. So very briefly, uh, background to DORA. Background to DORA is expanding uh, attack surface for all organizations, particularly uh, financial institutions, more and more ways in which we enable people to work, uh, mobile, uh, multiple devices, uh, services in the cloud, outsource services, uh, and the threat horizon gets fuller and fuller. And there are more and more ways in which attackers can uh, come at us. Uh, and that's exacerbated by, uh, 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 by AI, by deep fakes. Uh, those are all ways in which attackers have a better opportunity or a better set of tools to penetrate our own, uh, uh, our own cyber perimeter and our own uh, cyber environment. Uh, so, so that's the background to DORA. Cyber threat is a systemic risk to the EU financial sector because of the level of interconnectedness between uh, financial organizations, the extent of their reliance on um, external um, ICT third party service providers, uh, a, an attack, a successful attack on one entity could not only hit the whole of a sector or the whole of a sector in a country, but could spread across the whole of the EU. So thinking about how to deal with that has led to the Digital Operations Resilience Act. Um, it sets out a harmonized approach to digital operational resilience across the entire uh, financial sector in 27 different countries. It's a regulation supported by uh, three specific directives. 
Um, it sets out very specific requirements for organizations in the financial sector, simply called financial entities, and their third party ICT service providers. And frankly, it might look as though this is really a big implementation challenge for uh, financial entities. It's a very big in implementation challenge for um, ICT uh, third party service providers. We'll begin touching on that a bit in this webinar. We will be running other webinars uh, later on in the series aimed specifically at helping. Um, ICT service providers think about how they can deal with the specific compliance requirements that affect them. But um, uh, this will be, uh, while you know many FEs, financial entities are used to compliance, they've been regulated by competent authorities for uh, many years, this kind of regulation will be new to many service providers. So um, the Act itself sets out five procedures or five processes that most organizations should have in place, but they effectively become regulated processes under DORA. The uh, ICT risk management process, incident reporting, digital operational resilience testing, information sharing, and third-party risk management. Uh, uh, they're sometimes called the five DORA pillars, uh, but those are the five processes that all organizations should have in place. DORA simply says, if you don't, you must have. If you do, well, that's good, but you need to and now make sure that they comply specifically uh, with what we set out in this set of regulations. Um, and the uh, regulations not only cover uh, how you need to deal with those three, those five processes, but they also set out very specific requirements in respect of the contractual arrangements between financial entities and their ICT third party service providers, which are designed primarily around the twin concepts of ensuring the best possible and most reliable service from a service provider. But on the other hand, where a service provider is um, affected or uh, its risk profile becomes unacceptable, it's possible for a financial entity to terminate its contract and move to an alternative uh, without disrupting service to its customers. So um, that's a pretty critical part of uh, implementation for most organizations. Uh, DORA also provides a rule, set of rules for oversight framework for critical ICT third party service providers. That's the ones who are uh, maybe single points of failure or um, whose service is so critical to a sector that um, failure can have uh, very significant impacts on the sector. And also provides rules for cooperation among the supervisory authorities and on how supervision and enforcement should work, which I'm not going to spend time on today because essentially it gives more power to existing competent uh, authorities. The three European supervised authorities, the EBA, the EIOPA and ESMA, um, have, uh, they, will, they, they are empowered to produce further technical requirements uh, from an implementation point of view. Our advice to customers is don't wait for those. Uh, there's more than enough to do. You need to get on with uh, tackling compliance right now. Um, until those technical requirements are published, the DORA regulation itself is pretty detailed in terms of what has to be done. Not so good on how, but certainly very good on what. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that while financial entities on the face of it have to comply with the Network and Information Services Directive, uh, now in its second iteration, uh, NIS 2 is very clear in Article 4 that um, if you uh, also have to comply with DORA, you don't also have to comply with uh, NIS 2. So that's an important uh, clarification. But you've also got to bear in mind that as a financial entity, if you have to comply with uh, PSD 2, you've got to transition to PS. PCI DSS version 4, or you've got to carry out swift self-attestation, you've got to do those as well. You've got to find a way of uh, bringing all of those elements of your activity together. And the intelligent organizations want to find a way of doing that in an integrated framework. So you're not dealing with it in silos, which don't overlap, and in the intersections or the non-intersections of which there is opportunity for attackers to uh, do significant damage. Uh, the regulation entered into force on the 18th of, 16th of January 2023. So we are over a year through the transition period. It will apply from the 17th of January 2025. You've got until the 17th of January 2025 to be compliant. Remember, that's not the date from which you should start getting compliant. It's the date from which you have to be compliant. It's the date from which if you are not compliant, technically the supervisory authorities can levy fines. 
they can take any of the enforcement action that is within their power. And it might seem that uh, given that there are still technical standards to come out, the fact that you've got to be compliant in less than a month, less than a year is challenging. It is challenging, but that's the law. That's how uh, the EU uh, has written its law. And it's kind of why uh, you need to be, if you're not already on track, uh, if you're thinking about tackling this in six months time, uh, you know, in six months time, you've only got five months left to get compliant. Uh, and the requirements are not simple. They're not things that, frankly, most organizations, unless you're already really sophisticated, will be able to get in place and get compliant to uh, in the remaining time. So it's worthwhile thinking what, looking at what the likely state of play will be come the 17th of January 2025. We think that there will be inconsistent implementation of DORA across the European Union with, within member states and within sectors. Some sectors will be ahead, some member states will be ahead, others will be behind. Some organisations will be ahead, others will be behind. It will not be a comprehensive uh, once one level of compliance achieved across the whole of the European Union. Um, and substantially Potential number of financial entities will not yet have completed their compliance uh, migration. Some may not even have started. Uh, the reality is there will be a number of ICT third party suppliers that are not yet compliant um, with contractual renegotiations still underway in very many cases. And, 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 and you need to be clear that there is a contractual renegotiation requirement for all ICT third party service providers. Um, it's not yet necessarily completely clear who counts as an ICT third party service provider. Uh, it's possible that it might include a very substantial number of organizations whose cloud based applications, for instance, you rely on at the moment, like Azure. Um, uh, um, but uh, so that's quite a complex area. Um, there are inconsistencies in terms of the overlap between what DORA requires and what other compliance frameworks like PCI, SWIFT, PSD2, GDPR and so on uh, might require, those haven't yet been ironed out by uh, regulators. Uh, they're going to be there because they're laws. Uh, PSD2 is a directive. Um, uh, SWIFT is a set of compliance requirements. PCI is a set of contractual compliance requirements. Uh, they're going to have to get ironed out in a way that uh, organizations, if they can, will want to try and avoid them being uh, um, uh, areas of uh, expense uh, as a result of inefficiency. Cyber breaches will continue to happen and they will continue to increase in number and severity. Cyber attackers will continue to uh, look at DORA as a, uh, an excuse to test their mettle. Um, they will look at failures to report as opportunities to uh, leverage uh, bigger ransoms. We've seen that happen already in the United States where the SEC regulation requires organizations to uh, report serious cyber breaches within four days. And we've seen uh, attackers who've uh, made a ransomware payment, uh, actually get a hold of the SEC and say, we've just broken into this organization. Um, they're under huge stress. They're supposed to pay us a ransom. They haven't reported it to you yet. Um, what do you want to do about it? Um, and supervised authorities will have untested enforcement capabilities and there will be inconsistency in terms of response across the EU. That's kind of how we think it will look. It's a bit like how it looked with GDPR. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, we think we'll see much the same uh, in terms of uh, of DORA. So uh, what does that mean from a compliance point of view? Well, in thinking about approaching compliance, and uh, there is a, a good book just published in the last day or so, DORA, a guide to the EU Digital Operation Resilience Act, which may be uh, more interesting reading than simply uh, tackling the, uh, uh, the documentation itself. Um, Step one is to make sure that your current cybersecurity is up to scratch. Make sure that you secure your digital perimeter. That's about penetration testing and remediation, making sure that you're not breached. The right way, the best way to stay out of, away from attention from uh, supervised authorities is to make sure you don't have a breach to report. Deal with the social engineering threat. That's where the majority of attacks come in. So anti-phishing staff awareness, uh, anti-phishing staff training, uh, all of those activities which are designed to help people make sure uh, that they they can spot a phishing email and don't click on it. And allied to that, of course, is incident response, making sure your incident response mechanisms are really up to scratch. So that's number one. Make sure you keep 
out of trouble. Number two, start talking to your critical ICT third party service providers now. Uh, think about where single points of failures, that spoffs, might be. Initiate the process for renegotiating contracts. There's a long process of uh, conversation with uh, providers. It could be that there will be providers you currently rely on and go, well, actually, I'm not going to go on providing services because of the complexity of the new contracts, which means you've got to find alternatives. Get started on that now. Remember, there's just 11 months uh, to go. In parallel, kick off your DORA compliance program. Training for key roles. DORA uh, makes training a uh, legal requirement. It's not a, an optional think I shall do this. Key roles and all staff awareness is a legal requirement now that people undergo uh, training, undergo annual staff awareness training. Draw on best practice guidance and expertise for information security management, incident response, business continuity. That's uh, primarily the ISO standards. We'll look at them very shortly. Um, and remember that DORA requires continuous updating, management review, and oversight of digital operation resilience. Not a do it once, um, it's a do it again and again and again. Every time that you have a breach, every time uh, you have a change in infrastructure, uh, every time uh, there is a new threat, you have to review your risk assessment. You want to make sure it's up to date. So make sure you're putting in place the, um, the functionality and the capabilities that enable you to do that on an ongoing basis. And that's a necessary thing to do because the reality is that uh, cyber threats change, the environments change, and so being able to review and operate uh, is, is critical. So that's how we think you should approach it. Um, we think it's a positive step. We think that for organizations who see DORA not as a compliance burden, but uh, as a uh, critical uh, competitive advantage are the organizations who will do best in this environment. It's an act of the European Parliament. It's regulated by national bodies. We also think it's a new global standard. We think that other financial sectors will follow. Um, we think that they will follow not just at a kind of low level, but at this kind of uh, serious focus on operational resilience. And other financial sectors will follow because otherwise they will lose business to the European Union. Organizations will migrate to a place where they know that their customers will feel uh, they are best protected and their funds are best protected. Um, it affects financial entities and their digital supply chains. It'll hit global operations centers. It will trickle down to the ICT sector, which means that um, ICT suppliers will have to consistently raise their game. Um, it also means that the cybersecurity measures which go in place to protect the financial system uh, will protect uh, the countries, the EU member states, and uh, the, 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 the EU financial sector from systemic risk. And that concentration supply chain risk, again, uh, helps, the, uh, helps the sector become more resilient. And you can think of that as um, safeguarding the economy via the financial system. So the European Union regulating financial entities has a trickle down impact on ICT third party service providers. It identifies critical service providers, makes sure that actually they can't, uh, if they get into trouble, uh, completely disrail key parts of the sector that trickles down to third party uh, providers, their own suppliers. And it looks at the way in which um, SLAs and, and, and operating level agreements are effectively deployed to ensure that services are, are delivered at the level they should be without disrupting services to customers. That's a key plank, uh, if you like, of DORA's approach. Penetration testing, reports being capable of being used, incident reporting being effective, uh, risk analysis and reporting. Um, all of that flowing through and being supported by uh, internal audits, supply chain audits, uh, management of changes in processes and software, uh, management of contract changes, all of those becoming much more robust and effective, meaning that the sector becoming itself more resilient. Um, and in particular, as the EU regulates uh, critical ICT third party uh, service providers, um, so the Regulators, regulated financial entities themselves need to consider um, how they not only comply, but how they get their suppliers to comply, recognizing that um, some, compli some suppliers will comply, um, some suppliers will uh, get what they need to do and will do it, but, um, but they'll lose some because some won't get it, they won't want to get it, they won't get compliant, uh, which means that you'll have to go and find alternative uh, suppliers as quickly as you can. You'll retain some, there'll be some suppliers who uh, get compliant so quickly that they're able to go and gain additional customers, but that might mean they suddenly themselves become um, a critical um, 
uh, uh, critical suppliers, they become subject to the additional regulation around critical supplies. So there's a lot of change going to happen around the um, the whole supply chain area. Um, and that's one of the areas in which if you get on with making sure that you have people who are competent themselves in managing uh, your compliance, uh, you can buy yourself time because you buy yourself ability to anticipate and manage uh, the change that's, that happens down through your entire supply chain. The regulatory structure, how is DORA going to be enforced? It's going to be enforced through the existing European supervisory authorities and through the national competent authorities. So um, the EIOPA, the EBA and ESMA will continue providing supervision across the whole of the EU. But as you know, um, there are competent authorities at the national uh, level. They will continue being the uh, mechanism for how uh, we deal with uh, um, regulating financial entities and regulating ICT suppliers at the national uh, level. Um, not only are there some new standards due out, but through the uh, European National Institute for, for, for Cybersecurity for NISA, um, regulatory technical standards for uh, further harmonization uh, for um, the um, for incident classification uh, are, are all due to come out. Think of them as standards which when they come out, you apply to enhance the steps you've already taken to make sure that you are compliant. Implement now, get on with your implementation program so that you put yourself in position to uh, evolve as requirements get to be clearer, so you're not starting from scratch as requirements get to be clearer, because requirements will get to be much more detailed. Um, and starting with a very detailed project is painful if you've only got a narrow window to comply with. If you've got all the basics in place and you're just simply dealing with uh, um, uh, very specific additional details, it's a lot simpler to get yourself to the appropriate level of compliance. So um, that's the that's the way to deal with it in the regulatory environment. Building resilience as an ent entity, if you're a financial entity or if you're a supplier, building resilience is a good way to survive and win business. It's a good way you build resilience by mitigating cyber risks, identifying them, um, reducing data breaches and losses. Uh, becoming compliant means that uh, you are able to win more business. It means that you, uh, if you do have a breach, you're not going to suffer the kinds of fines and investigations that non-compliant organizations do. And that frankly turns into a competitive edge and turns into operational efficiency, which enables you to win more business to become more successful, to drive up margins uh, and drive uh, drive improvements. So the benefits of uh, DORA compliance, they come from proactive risk management, not waiting for something to happen to you, not waiting to be forced into it by the deadlines of uh, DORA. So proactive risk management, addressing vulnerabilities before they escalate, means that you can think of resilience uh, and your goals around resilience as part of your longer term business planning rather than something you simply has to address and fit into a narrow compliance window. Because as I said, the more resilient and robust you become as an organization, uh, the more you're able to boost investor and stakeholder confidence, customer confidence, uh, that leads to additional investment, growth and partnerships, helps customers uh, recognize that you're the place to be coming for the services they need, the protection of both personal data and sensitive financial data against data breaches, again, continues to protect you, uh, protect you from all of the ramifications of a breach. And every breach these days appears to have a significant element of personal data compromise in it. And a strong reputation in today's environment for operational resilience is unquestionably a major contributor to organizations winning new business. So you can think at an individual level uh, about building cyber defense in depth and the uh, five key steps that DORA requires all organizations to take, which is to um, identify basically what has to be protected, the, um, the elements, the assets and the processes that have to be detected to protect them with an appropriate set of policies, procedures and so on to detect attacks. Um, to do all of the things necessary to do that, to respond to them, and when breached, to recover from them. You can think of that as a uh, defense in depth model. That's a requirement on all organizations, irrespective of uh, what happens with DORA. You ought to be thinking about how you do that in any case. 
And thinking about that um, really is much about thinking about ISO uh, and how it ties into the five DORA pillars. So if the five DORA pillars are risk management, incident management, uh, operational resilience testing, ICT, uh, third-party risk management, information and intelligence sharing, and frankly, information and intelligence sharing, while important, is a minor element in your, um, uh, in your compliance journey. Uh, the biggest element is getting the risk management processes in place, making sure that uh, you are able to deal effectively with identifying and managing risk because it's not just about risk, it's about processes, it's about functions, it's about systems, it's about people, it's about everything that's impacted and making sure that you've got a complete scope. An incident management process which integrates into your business continuity plan, uh, which is tried and tested. And of course, the whole panoply of your processes equally need to be tried and tested. And DORA requires that uh, requires that you use independent penetration testers, independent auditors to do that. The independents could be inside the organization, but they have to be independent from uh, the part of the business and the reporting lines of the part of the business that they're testing. So, um, so that's a critical uh, element. How are you going to demonstrate that you are carrying out the critical third party testing? Got to be part of your budgeting. Managing third party risk means you've got to identify who your third party suppliers are, which ones are critical to you, which ones could you live without, uh, getting involved in uh, creating a register uh, of, uh, of contracts. You've got to be able to share that register of contracts with uh, your supervisory authority. So there's a lot of work to do around implementing uh, those standards. What DORA is doing is basically saying good IT governance is now no longer good practice. It's enshrined in law. ISO standards, which you can follow, they tell you how to go about compliance are, are voluntary. And, and, and that's quite a good way of thinking about it. DORA tells you what must be done. It doesn't tell you how to do it. Um, DORA does say you, sh you, you should, you must turn to national and international standards where appropriate, where they exist, uh, particularly when dealing with ICT third party suppliers. As a financial entity, you have to insist on the highest possible level of uh, performance, and that includes specifically compliance with national and international standards and the most appropriate and highest possible uh, level of uh, security, including personal data, says uh, says Dora. Um, and ISO 27001, the latest standard is 2022. That's what you want to be compliant with, not 2013. If you're a 2013 compliance standard, you need to get yourself up to 2022, frankly, before January the 17th, 2025, even though ISO 27001 uh, allows you until October 2025 to make the transition. DORA doesn't. DORA says you must comply with the latest standard. Um, there's a risk management version, ISO 27005. 22301 is the latest version of the business continuity standard. Remember, these draw on established pools of expertise, people who know how to implement them. They know the how. They might not understand the what DORA requires, but they know the how. So you could use that kind of expertise as part of your implementation program. And what I've done in this slide is link the best practice standards that are available, and the best practice uh, um, qualifications that are available to you to each of the five main pillars of, uh, of DORA. So um, uh, uh, lead implementer and lead auditor qualifications around 22301 and 27001. Um, uh, those are their uh, incident management qualifications, the ISO 27035 standard for incident management, pen testers, ethical hackers, um, uh, in terms of third party risk management, compliance platforms, uh, supply chain audits. Uh, there, are, there are good practice standards for how to do all of those things. And that means you don't need to learn from scratch how to address them. You can simply look at existing good practice and draw from that to take forward your own compliance program. So how do you prepare for uh, and tackle uh, tackle exactly that? Well, uh, you need to do a comprehensive risk assessment. So um, start off by uh, um, so doing that, so take your risk assessment, make sure your risk assessment process is set up in a way that deals with the entirety of what Dora says it should do. Um, you must identify uh, systems uh, and processes and data and people and sites that are within scope. So make sure that it does, make sure it's identified the suppliers on whose services you depend. They're all within scope for the uh, risk assessment. A good proactive risk assessment means you can identify risks before they become significant issues. You can put mitigating controls in place. Develop and 
uh, and implement a robust incident response plan so that now don't wait until Dora comes in so that today you're responding quickly to uh, I clicked on an email that I shouldn't have can I report it yes what do I do next uh, all of those things need to be reporting need, needs to be dealing with really really quickly start resilience testing now uh, if you're not already deploying penetration testing uh, internal audits external auditors third-party auditors supply chain auditors start work on that because that will flash out significant vulnerabilities that need to be part of your ongoing uh, mitigation activity and mitigating those risks particularly in third parties um, starting to look at where your single points of failure are, um, which suppliers are going to not want to continue uh, dealing with that today is a pretty key part of uh, being in a position to, to be compliant in the longer run. Looking at knowledge sharing, lead by example, be an advocate for DORA. Uh, all of those are sensible, logical ways to uh, turn DORA into a, uh, into a competitive edge for the organization. In the remaining 11 months, and there's less than 11 months now, 17th of January 2025, uh, Bear in mind, these are the milestones. Do you know what you're doing? Build knowledge and competence uh, as quickly as possible across the board and within the organization. Training for key roles, uh, boards, for risk directors, for compliance officers, for uh, implementers, auditors, uh, that's mandatory. It's, it's not a, it's a good idea. It's a legal requirement. Staff awareness training, it's a legal requirement. So start looking at how you're going to do that. Make sure you begin to understand the intricacies of DORA, not just from a point of view of reading the law, that's what lawyers are for, but from the point of view of implementing it. What do we have to do to actually comply with what DORA says? Do a gap analysis. This is what Dora says we have to do. This is what we're doing, uh, perhaps to comply with uh, the Network and Information Security Directive. What are we? Uh, what's the gap between what we are doing and what we have to do? How do we close that gap? Start putting together the updates and changes and amendments to your policies and procedures. Make sure that the specific mandates of DORA are dealt with. And there's now a very specific set. It's in the draft technical standard of policies and procedures that DORA requires. You're going to need to have those in place. So start thinking about how you, uh, how you get there right now. Think about the technologies that you might need to put in place to meet DORA's uh, very tough uh, compliance, security compliance requirements. Think about um, how you're going to test, uh, not just penetration testing and audits, but all the rest of the testing, the tabletop exercises you're going to do around making sure that your continuity plans are up to scratch. All of those become, from the 17th of January next year, they are legal requirements. You need to, they need to be in place and working before you get there. Map your supply chain, work out which are your key vendors, work out which vendors are other organizations are going to be dependent on and which might therefore be a risk for you single points of failure that's also complex in itself but start looking at renegotiation of contracts to bring them into line with again dora's mandated uh, requirements about contractual clauses um, look at um, uh, what you might do in terms of uh, revising in your supply chain so it's a it's a, there's a lot of work to get on with Frankly, uh, most organizations are going to need to leverage automation to do that. Uh, CyberComply is one logical platform to turn to out of the box. CyberComply functionality provides a dashboard that enables directors to see at a glance where the organization is in terms of its compliance initiatives, enables you to automate uh, risk assessments to continually update and revise. That can suck in an asset inventory, can do data flow mapping, can manage uh, um, threats, likelihoods, uh, can give you customizable risk scales, can do everything that you need to do in a way that, frankly, a spreadsheet uh, cannot. A spreadsheet is itself a huge risk. So a platform like CyberComply gives you a risk assessment. It gives you data flow mapping that enables you to integrate into your risk assessment. What are the processes? Where are the assets? What are the dependencies? You can select mitigating controls from multiple best practice frameworks, produce a risk treatment plan, which you can automatically update as you revise the risk assessment, uh, decide you need a different control. It will automatically flow through on a platform like CyberComply. Um, it has policy and procedure documentation. CyberComply has some 30 sets of standards and frameworks. The uh, DORA-specific documentation is in production. Uh, it manages cyber incidents. There will be an API that logs, that, 
that takes the cyber incident management prof uh, um, uh, components of cyber comply and enables it to talk to help desk so that you get transparent tracking of cyber incidents. Uh, you can audit them, you can evidence S lessons learned. It's a key part of how you comply with DORA in respect of cyber incidents. Audit management in production, external, internal orders can audit your entire DORA compliance activity and compliance across all your other frameworks and standards. Um, that's in production will be available uh, apparently by the end of this quarter. Um, and third party vendor management, uh, exactly the kinds of areas we've been talking about um, is on the roadmap for uh, the quarter following that. So cyber comply is a platform to look at uh, uh, in terms of how do you automate, how do you deploy, how do you get best practice and use it to accelerate your own compliance uh, journey. IT governance, more than 15 years experience helping organizations meet GRC uh, objectives. We are CREST certified penetration testers. We are a cyber essentials uh, uh, certification body. We're also Cyber Essentials Plus certified. We're ISO 27001 certified for uh, 10 or more years. Uh, we're a global Euro privacy consultancy partner. We do PCI, SWIFT consultancy. We are an IBITGQ accredited training organization. They have five DORA professional qualifications already um, available for people to go on. So through IT governance, and hopefully those of you on this webinar will uh, understand that, you can access everything that you need to progress your DORA compliance journey in a way that enables us to help you translate our promise of our expertise helps your peace of mind. Um, and some of the particular uh, products and services that can help uh, include DORA Foundation Training, Certified Practitioner uh, Training, which goes through exactly how do we go about implementing, how do we draw on best standards, but how do we demonstrate that we are compliant with what DORA requires. Uh, a DORA Gap Analysis, our consultants can help you do that. Uh, we have a DORA Staff Awareness Training course. Of course, the book I mentioned earlier on, uh, there's training for compliance officers that's particularly focused on uh, the supply chain, both in the supply chain and in organizations dealing with the supply chain. Lead auditors, how does a lead auditor go about planning and executing an audit in compliance with DORA? It's more than just simply an ISO 27001 audit um, because it encompasses uh, a whole lot of best practice, but very specific requirements of DORA. And of course, for uh, DORA, uh, the, the members of the senior management team who are going to be uh, charged with managing uh, IT ICT risk, they themselves need competence. So a number of ways in which both through um, uh, through consultancy, uh, through and we are doing, uh, we're beginning to talk to clients right now about how we can help them make the transition, but through a whole bunch of ways in which you can help yourself through acquiring skills, staff awareness training, uh, platform books, guidance, and so on, that we can help you uh, make progress with DORA. And that's taken me marginally longer than I uh, meant to, for which I apologize, but we are at the point of the webinar, which is designed for uh, questions, ladies and gentlemen. So if you do have questions, please, in the um, uh, question function in your um, go to webinar panel, uh, you can type in uh, any questions that you've got and what I'll do. Um, and there are a few uh, uh, already. What I'll do is I'll read the um, I'll read the question out and then I'll, then I'll answer it. And so do put questions in as we go along. Um, but starting with the first question, is DORA only um, opposite to the financial sector or all organizations? How does PCI overlap with DORA? So um, DORA applies to uh, financial entities in the European Union, 22,000 only. Um, and it also applies to ICT third party service providers to financial entities. So if you're an ICT third party service provider and your customer are, um, are retail companies, uh, manufacturing companies, you're outside the scope of DORA. It's only if you're an ICT third party service provider providing services to the financial sector that you're within scope. And it obviously also applies to organizations operating in the EU or based outside the EU providing services into the EU. And that particularly catches ICT third party service providers because there are many based outside the EU serving EU entities. They are within scope for, uh, for DORA. PCI is applicable because there will be uh, many payment providers, for instance, in the EU who are going to who have to comply with uh, PCI DSS. They also have to comply with um, 
uh, DORA. Uh, PCI has very specific requirements around how you do risk assessments, the documentation you put in place around how you manage uh, payments and data. Uh, that overlaps with a number of the requirements of DORA, and you want to try and find a way that you can do that cost effectively. Do people, companies in the US have to be DORA compliant? Uh, no, you do not have to be if you're in the US unless A, you are providing uh, financial services into EU, so you're a regulated, you have a regulated um, EU subsidiary perhaps, or uh, you're providing services, you might be a global service center, um, you might be um, selling products and services through uh, the EU. If it's a regulated EU uh, service, you're going to have to be DORA compliant. So it's the, the, the scope, if you're, in the, and of course, the other thing is if you're in the US and you're providing uh, uh, ICT third party services to uh, EU financial sector providers, financial sector organizations, you're probably caught by that. And that could well include uh, platform as a service, uh, infrastructure as a service, uh, all of those clearly fall within the ICT service provider definition of uh, of DORA. And uh, while I'm sure there will be quite a lot of more detailed work around that, at the moment it looks as though if you're providing an ICT service, which is a digital service, to FE, financial entities in the uh, in the EU, you are captured by DORA. And I think that means there's a very large number of organizations who are going to find themselves, uh, ha find themselves um, uh, having to comply. Um, do EU registered insurance intermediaries have to be DORA compliant? I can't tell you that specifically. Go to uh, DORA. You can download DORA from the EU website. Uh, you can get in all the national languages. If you go to Article uh, 2, I believe, Article 4, I believe, Article 4 lists all of the specific sectors uh, that fall within uh, the requirements of DORA, and it also identifies specifically uh, which subsectors are out with the requirements. So I'm afraid that's the answer for you. Um, there are no who are DORA certifying authorities. There are currently no DORA certifying authorities. You can't get a certificate of compliance. Um, it's a bit like having to comply with the Prudential Rulebook. You can't get a certificate of compliance. You'll get audited by supervisory authorities. You need to demonstrate uh, compliance. That's exactly the same environment that will apply to DORA. Uh, the final uh, arbiter, if you want to take it that far, will be a court because it's a law um, and it is therefore subject to uh, both EU-wide and national uh, legal systems. But but it's it's the the compliance process from a legal perspective is exactly the same as complying with prudential rule books within the EU i.e. where does one register and will there be some form of AOC from a DORA point of view? No. Um, if you are, uh, if you fall within the scope of DORA, you've simply got to get on with and be compliant by the 17th of uh, January. You need to talk to your supervisor authority. If you are a service, if you are a financial entity, you should know who your supervisor authority is. Talk to them. If you're an ICT service provider um, and you have financial FE customers, talk to them and get your uh, program of compliance underway. Uh, if you want to know how to do it, go on something like the DORA practitioner training course because it goes through in quite a lot of detail the steps necessary to uh, put yourself in a way to be uh, compliant. Why do we need another standard to comply to? Why not simply extending eyes or any other standard and release the new version and ask? I, 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 uh, I couldn't agree more, but um, that's the decision. The EU has decided that, I guess, because ISO is effectively a voluntary standard, while it's a specification, um, it's wanted to go further than ISO um, and set out very specific uh, requirements around what organizations have to do and make it law so that organizations can be held accountable. And I'm guessing that the reason they've done that is because relying on organizations to do it themselves has not proven over the years to be a winning formula. Most organizations simply haven't got themselves a appropriately secure, which is why we go on seeing more and more uh, breaches. So um, I'm afraid I can't give you a real argument on uh, that I'm not a politician. How the DORA compliance will interact with PCI version 4? Um, what are the similarities and differences? Uh, that's a perfectly good question. Um, I think you probably need to go on one of the specialist courses that looks at that. Uh, there are a number of overlaps um, and there's quite a lot of work going on to tease out exactly uh, where those are. Most organizations are hard at work trying to get themselves PCI version 4 compliant. 
uh, platforms like Cyber Comply uh, will very specifically provide the overlaps, will enable you to uh, quickly identify how they overlap and get in place uh, appropriate compliance processes. You have NIST 2, PCI, etc. already available to comply to. Um, they, well, they don't deal exactly the same. Um, NIST 2 isn't financial sector uh, specific. NIST 2 doesn't deal with uh, ICT third party service providers. It doesn't focus comprehensively on systemic risk to the financial sector. Um, and its uh, supervisory authorities are not necessarily the supervisory authorities for the financial entity. So what uh, DORA does is it makes the enforcement of uh, NIST 2, if you like, but the much more comprehensive version that applies to financial entities, uh, all of a piece with the existing enforcement processes for uh, national, national uh, financial enforcement. Will companies such as telcos be bound door as connectivity service providers to FEs? Uh, um, the answer to that is yes. Uh, analog telco providers, no. Digital telco providers, yes. Uh, they, they will have to uh, be compliant. DORA being an EU act, does it apply to the UK? No, it doesn't. Uh, the EU is outside it. Uh, if you're a UK uh, financial entity or an EU, UK ICT service provider um, and you're providing services into the EU, you'll have to comply. Um, but the reality is that the, um, uh, the central bank in the UK um, and the regulatory authorities in the UK already have and are proceeding on from very specific requirements around uh, operational integrity and operational resilience uh, in the UK. So um, it's, you, you don't get away from the uh, need to comply, you just comply to something slightly different in the UK. Does DORA, does, do EU registered insurance intermediaries? I think I already answered that. Do, e, do DORA, does DORA apply in the education sector? No, the education sector is outside of the scope for DORA. Um, so cyber comply is the best self-service way to evaluate compliance and identify gaps. Um, uh, alternatively, it's on-site consulting gap analysis. Um, you could, uh, there will be a gap analysis tool available through uh, through our EU and uh, UK sites, which you could, uh, um, uh, which you can subscribe to. I'm not sure if it's a subscription or a purchase, uh, which you can use as a tool to help you do a gap analysis yourself. Um, the problem with a standalone tool is you've then got to do something with it. Um, you should be able to upload the results, if you like, into a platform like CyberComply. Um, but there are multiple different ways that you could do it. The logical way is to go for, frankly, from our point of view, tools like the gap analysis tool we've developed and how that can integrate into CyberComply because it can make your um, dealing with what the gaps are that much more effective. ICT service provider, will this include fintech platform services? I would say it's a racing certainty. Is a payment provider subject to DORA? Again, I'd say it's a racing certainty. Does the ISO 27001 uh, framework cover the DORA requirements or there are some additional? Um, so the ISO 27001 requirements give you a lot of the, how do you go about complying with DORA? If you implement ISO 27001, we think you will be 75 or 80% of the way to meeting um, DORA's requirements around risk management and incident response. Um, you need to implement ISO 22301 to be 75 or 80% of the way to meeting its requirements around business continuity. The rest is the specific requirements of DORA, which need to be bolted on top of those processes. So we talk to organizations about how you can take the ISO 27002 control set, those map to the five defense in depth requirements of DORA, uh, and you can therefore make sure that you've got appropriate controls in place and you can add on top of them the legal specifics that DORA is looking for. Does cyber comply evaluate TPP, ICT, MSSPs themselves? Um, can you use cyber comply? Uh, not yet, it's on the roadmap. Uh, you will be able to use it to assess the compliance of um, uh, third party providers uh, through your supply chain and manage their entire compliance activity. Um, that's on the roadmap uh, for, uh, for next quarter. How does COVID-5 fit in? Uh, COVID-5 is a control framework, uh, which is uh, it's a very effective control framework. It's a very complex control framework. Uh, you could use it instead of ISO uh, 27001, 22301 to meet your 
uh, DORA compliance requirements. Uh, uh, word of advice is that COVID is really appropriate for large organizations who have significantly capable uh, implementation teams. It's a very comprehensive program um, and it really does work in enterprises. Uh, we can help organizations who want to implement COVID. We've got, you know, we, 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 we're, we're platform agnostic, uh, standard agnostic. We do whatever clients want. But uh, practically speaking, COVID is really appropriate for big organizations. Um, and if you want to to implement COBIT starting from scratch. Now, if you don't already have COBIT in place, you have less chance of being ready for um, DORA deadline than if you haven't got ISO 27001 in place, simply because of the um, complexity of, of COVID. Very good platform, as I said, it's, it's an enterprise oriented, uh, needs a large enterprise team to take forward. Um, Third party compliance, does the supplier need to be compliant or is it only the service they provide that needs to be compliant? Well, um, it's, it's, it's primarily around the service, um, but to the extent that the service is dependent on the supplier, the supplier also needs to be compliant. So Dora says specifically that you need to be clear that the, the, the services you're getting from third parties um, are robust, that you can rely on them, they won't be corrupt, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it also says specifically that the provider of those services needs, needs to meet your highest standards of due diligence. It needs to be uh, compliant in terms of security, GDPR. Um, it needs to be financially robust. Um, you need to be able to manage what happens if the supplier of the service itself uh, ceases to be able to provide the service. So um, the answer is, practically speaking, it's both. You have to be compliant in terms of the service and compliant, but slightly different criteria, compliant in terms of the organization itself. Um, uh, interesting that there is no overt reward for one's efforts to achieve DORA um, without a certification. It's not clear if you have or have not until you get audited and exposed. So it feels less of a competitive advantage and more of a way of feeding us in the uh, audit industry. Yeah, no, I understand that completely. Um, it's you know entirely a logical approach, given that um, for most organizations, the uh, reality is that every time you go to a customer, they're going to say to you, are you DORA compliant or not? Uh, you're going to want to simply say, yes, you are. Uh, you don't necessarily want to produce an audit report to do that, but you have the simple challenge of if you say, yes, we are compliant, if to your um, supervisor authority, we say, yes, we are compliant, and you later have a breach and it turns out that you weren't compliant, then you're facing a negligence action, which uh, in the EU under DORA can be levied against management and individuals as well as against companies. So, um, you know, you, you don't need to do an audit. You don't need to, uh, there isn't a requirement to have an AOC like there is for PCI. There isn't yet a badge that says you're compliant. Um, I, you know, I expect that something will emerge over the course of the next uh, nine to 12 months for exactly the reasons that you um, identify, but it will be slow to catch on. The reality is that being able to say that you are hand on heart, DORA compliant is where the competitive edge uh, exists. The fact that you are not scrambling to get yourself compliant to meet an audit from a new customer. And that's particularly true, true of ICT third party service providers, all of whom are going to have to satisfy themselves before they take you on or continue buying services from you that you are DORA compliant. So, um, you, you know, as, as I see it, it's, it's not really the audit industry. Um, the audit industry is going to provide a bunch of services to organizations. Um, we, we look at DORA as being something which, to be frank, simply says you need to go and buy everything you can around ISO 27001, 22301 plus simply to get yourself up to scratch to meet the requirements of DORA. Um, but again, good organizations uh, like we think of ourselves will try and make those services available really cost effectively and pragmatically to organizations that recognize the reality of you've got a business to run. You want to be able to draw on our services to enable you to get on with doing that um, without needing to have a whole lot of unnecessary uh, processes and documentation grafted into, into your business. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that we're kind of out of time. I think I've managed without uh, going completely hoarse to answer all of the questions there have been slides and recording will go out to everybody. I hope it has been a uh, useful uh, uh, session for you. Uh, please do feel free if we can help you uh, come back to us. There are a lot of ways in which um, uh, you can make contact with us in the EU, in the UK and in the US. Uh, do join us for future webinar webinars in the series. Thank you and have a good rest of today. Bye bye.